Hi, you. Oh, oh, is that just sweetheart? Oh, you are why I give up my Sundays. <gasps> is that me? Hi, I'm Kitty Monk, and I'm here to talk to you about Family Guy. Or more specifically, Glenn Quagmire and his relationship with cats. You know, I like to talk about social issues from time to time, but I think we've always forgotten about the ultimate ally. And it's not Ronaldo, it's Glenn Quagmire. He is the ultimate cat lover. All he cares about is love. Good thing I'm not a furry or I would be able to crown him ally. Instead, I shall eat his behavior up with a spoon, like catnip. Wait a second, is this why he hates Brian so much? Because Brian's a dog, and stereotypically, dogs and cats hate each other? Maybe he's subconsciously projecting prejudices of his own? Anyhow, this is one of my favorite Family Guy running gags, so let's discuss. Strangely enough, this character trait first begins in the episode 420, which on Hulu is labeled episode 420. At least it makes it easier to find. The guys are at the bar, but somehow missing Quagmire. Eh, no big whoop. Glenn is a pilot, and they're often away from home for long periods of time. Plus, maybe that's why he likes women so much. Turns out Quagmire is home and has a great surprise for them. He has adopted a stray cat named James. His name's James. Isn't he just the cutest thing you've ever seen? Hi, James. Really? Frickin' James? You couldn't give him a more creative name? I am obviously the exception, as my username came from a really mean nickname. But what about McCavity? Or Mr. Mistopheles? I mean, James is a ginger cat. He's very tall and thin. Granted, I know the naming of cats is a difficult matter in not one of your holiday games, but then again, all cats have three names. 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 Quagmire is practically in love with this cat. Oh, okay, here it comes, James. Here comes the part I was telling you about. <coughs> ah, you're one of those. Does he turn over and show you his belly and let you scratch it? That means he likes you. Quagmire starts to annoy the guys with his obnoxious cat-loving behavior, including Cleveland, and he's normally so patient. No, I need to borrow your lawnmower. Oh, I don't think Quagmire wants me to do that. I don't think Quagmire appreciated the condition you returned it in last time. Glenn, can I just- No, you can't have it. Oh, Glenn, I love you in a non-weird way. Quagmire wants to celebrate his cat's birthday, and he's going to Vermont to get James a special present. There's this neat little store called Catitudes that makes all this neat cat stuff. See you guys later. Aww. He's going all the way to Vermont for cat gifts and whatnot. You can get a scratching post down at Walmart for two dollars. It's not the same, Cleveland. It's not the same. But from what I hear, the Walmart near your house does have a McDonald's right in the store. Lucky. Mine has a subway. Joe suggests that as a prank, they should shave James. No, don't do that. Do not do that. That is like torture for cats. Brian grabs James by the nape of his neck. What is he, a titan? But Peter, well, I'm not showing it. That is how annoyed I am. Let's just say, Peter, if I ever end up making a list about the worst things you've ever done, which I'm on the fence about because cat joke, I might have to include the this episode. Brian says that they should simply hide the cat's body, and Peter makes it worse by raiding Glenn's fridge. You know, Peter, it's sort of adding insult to injury raiding Quagmire's fridge for beer after you killed his cat. Or is it? is my response. <sighs> this is probably like the one time I praise the fact that Family Guy has weird pacing, as this episode isn't about James, it's about Brian legalizing weed. But there is one scene we need to talk about. Hey guys, I want you to know I'm raising my reward to $50 for anyone who can help me find James. No questions asked. I killed your cat. <gasps> Ooh, 
we're in trouble. While this has become a major part of Glenn's character, especially in the later seasons, the thing is, this was mostly a running gag early on. Like in the episode Brothers and Sisters, where Quagmire is flying the plane that's meant to take Mayor West to Alaska after his disastrous breakup with Carol. Of course, Quagmire can't just fly the plane back to Quahog without a reason, or he would get fired again. So Peter uses Glenn's love of cats to get him to land. What that stray cat we got in our neighborhood? The pregnant one? Yep, she's having her kittens right now. <gasps> oh, no way! Yeah, but Brian's been eyeing them pretty good. What? Yeah, and I gotta go to work now, so I hope he's not, like, hungry or nothing. Oh god, you know Brian would do that. I mean, remember the squirrel incident? This is your captain speaking. We've discovered a shoe bomb on board. We're gonna have to return to the terminal. The 7700 Squawk, right? Am I using that term right? Or in Joe's Revenge, we meet Quagmire's newest pet cat, meant to replace James, Princess Abessa, which leads to a small subplot. Quagmire is going on the revenge trip with the guys, and he entrusts Lois to look after her. Of course, being Quagmire, he has a strict regimen for his feline friend. It's our pleasure. She looks like a nice kitty. Well, then shouldn't Princess Abessa be named Skitty? in that case? Uh, Kitty? Lois, she is a purebred Persian. I can trace her lineage to the cats kept by Cleopatra. Sorry, I just, I thought that as a cat myself, me and her were tight, and Skitty is one of my favorite Pokemon. I'm sorry! Now, as a former cat owner, oh, I love you, Mac and Cheese, one thing I did like about owning cats is that they aren't as much care as dogs. Outside of remembering to clean their litter box, or feeding them, or making sure they don't go outside, they pretty much watch themselves. Plus, growing up, I was super allergic to cat dander, and being around cats really helped me to build up the immunity. Ugh, if only I could do that with poison, like Afrin Pierce did. And just to put it out there, despite whatever jokes I make, I don't hate dogs. Even if I was afraid of them when I was a kid, I just don't think I could take care of one. Boy, it sure is nice having Mr. Quagmire's cat around. I gotta say, cats are so much better than dogs. <gasps> Thank you, Chris. You are my new favorite griffin. And for those of you asking how I am able to applaud without moving my hands, well, veggie tales. That's all I will say on the murder. Brian massively disagrees with this statement because, of course, he does. Well, that's kind of a broad statement. It's true. Okay, show me one way in which cats are better than dogs. I mean, is it okay to like both equally? Yeah, do what you just did, but with me. Oh! Oh my god! Oh! My neck! Oh, oh my god, Brian! Don't touch me! Don't touch me! Call somebody! Oh! The only reason Brian is eventually fine with Principessa being at the house is that it gives him certain ideas. He fell asleep with a cat right on her chest. Oh, this was always fun, in a non-weird way. It was great when I was sleeping, and they would just lay on my back. Meow. Purr. Purr. I think you're dreaming. No, I'm not. <gasps> but Lois put it best, meaning my work is done. Speaking of, does this mean Brian has claws? The claws! Why do they never come out? Mine are always out because Kitty can scratch. Wow. Too bad there's like no resolution here. Funny enough, this is not the last time we get to see Principessa. In Hard Boiled Meg, Quagmire got a serious case of the hiccups and nothing was working to cure him. It's torture, Peter, and it's driving me insane. Please, I'm begging you. Oh, I know the feeling. The trick is, you gotta stick a finger in your ear, or hold your nose, or both, and then drink as much water as possible. But there is one thing that eventually cures him, and it's Principessa. Bye, baby girl. Daddy's going away for a while. You know, I think Glenn would make sure that doctors won't rip out your brain on the off chance you're immune to cordyceps. Uh, uh, ow! Ouch! God, those claws went right through my pants! Oh my god. Oh my god, they're gone! 
kitty, you did it! All right, two things. One, are you super sure that happens? I hate that feeling. You think they're gone and then bam, they're back. Two, <gasps> Glenn, did you name your cat after me? I'm so touched. Heck, in Roads to Vegas, Brian goes to the Bellagio. Is it that one with all the sharks? And uses his winnings to do something he has wanted to for a while. <gasps> oh no, that poor cat! Good thing us cats have nine lives, normally. Or there's the fact that in Candy Quahog Marshmallow, one of the perks to Quagmire getting back together with Soon Jin was her cat Buttercup, who had a bunch of kittens. <gasps> what? That's right, your grandfather. My god! This is more than even I can handle. <laughs> In the later seasons, this feline love has become one of Quagmire's most notable character traits, not just a cute quirk. There are three episodes off the top of my head where Quagmire's love of cats is the focus. Let's start with Family Cat. It was the episode that gave me the idea to make this video, after all. Peter is at the bar where he's giving his opinion on real estate fixer upper shows. <sighs> Those are like my least favorite shows. I hate HGTV and I hate the episode South Park made about them. There's nothing new you can do with those types of shows. They are so restrictive and vanilla and boring. I'll watch anything except these stupid home renovation shows. It's mindless cookie cutter entertainment for wish fulfillment nobodies. Seth, are you trying to say something? The guys try to start their own real estate show. In the process, Peter makes a huge hole in the wall of the Griffin household where they spot somebody. Hey, this is my house. I'm gonna jump forward but backwards to show you how serious I am. Oh crap, there goes Brian with that internalized racism. As it were, the cat seems to be attracted to Meg, and she names it Pouncy. Aw, cute name. I mean, not as cute as Kitty or Mac and Cheese, but eh. What is that thing still doing here? That thing's name is Pouncy, and she's my cat now. As Pouncy can open up a cutaway, Peter and Lois allow Meg to keep it. She set up a cutaway? Wow. <laughs> Can I help you? And just like that, the Griffins have a cat. How do you know it's a girl? Are you assuming the cat's gender? Still, Meg has a lot of fun with her new pet. They indulge in activities together, like eating tuna. Oh, what do you think, Pounce? Wanna split a can of tuna? One can of tune, Ma, keep the water. Gross, I, I hate tuna. And you call yourself a cat. Once again, Brian doesn't like having Pouncy around the house. For no other reason than cats and dogs are natural enemies, like Zane Goose and Viper. I just feel like I should have been consulted on this decision to bring my natural enemy into the house. They may seem like good pets, but they always have ulterior motives. But why? I guess we're gonna have to Google. All right, from what I understand, thank you, Google, is that this is mostly just a stereotype. And honestly, it depends on the individual animal. They can get along just fine, albeit with certain challenges at first. After all, animals are fearful of strangers, and cats and dogs are polar opposites. Dogs are more social animals, and cats are more independent. Independent together. Or that cats naturally like to run, and dogs naturally like to chase small predators which can lead to problems. Oh, thank you, Google. But if a dog is scratched by a cat, they will apparently become ever fearful of that kind. Again, I don't know how true any of this is, but this is just what I got off of a quick Google search. If I'm correct, please comment down below. Brian keeps suspecting that something is up with Pouncy. After all, remember how he felt about the minstrel show that was Milo and Otis? We're good friends, aren't we, Milo? We're best friends friends, Otis. No! No! I reject the premise of this! The next day, Glenn goes to examine the Griffins, just to make sure they are appropriate cat owners. They are not. Remember Principessa? Or James? Is this necessary? You know us. Good people can still be bad cat owners, Lois. Ever heard of Eric Hornell? No. Oh. Eric Hornell? Who's that? 
Apparently, there is no record of this guy. I thought maybe it was an inside joke, like Cherry Chiva Prada Dumrong. But I did find an article on the Hornell Area Humane Society, if that counts. Quagmire examines Pouncey and says that Meg is good enough and can officially keep her. But he does warn them. What's toxoplasmosis? Parasite found in cat feces. If it gets in your bloodstream, it can make people a little crazy. It's really nothing to worry about, unless you're an owner like Eric Hornell. I think it's that parasite that makes you go blind if you have a compromised immune system, or can cause problems for your baby if you're pregnant. I don't know, it just wasn't it on an episode of Monsters Inside Me. I'm not a doctor, don't quote me. Just be careful when cleaning litter boxes, wash your hands, and don't eat undercooked meat. With the A-OK -okay from Quagmire, Meg and Pouncey continue to bond, be it through a music number at school that harkens back to Hot Honey Rag from Chicago, which I cannot play due to copyright, or just spending time together in general. With Pouncey being around the household permanently, Brian tries to make nice with her, which okay, good for him, trying to get past his prejudices. So just pick her off or push her off to the side or shake some treats or a box of macaroni to get her to move. That's what we did. Oh, hello. Look, I'm, I'm just trying to go downstairs, all right? I don't want any trouble. Okay, good talk. The thing is, it appears that Pouncey is not sentient, unlike Brian. Or is she? <laughs> oh my god, I'm totally in your head. <gasps> She's talking, and she sounds like Joanna from Rent. Joanna, Joanna. Wait, why is this such a shock to me? I mean, I can talk. Catherine can talk. Pouncey says that she has big plans for Meg. All cats can talk. We just choose not to respond. To anything. Ever. So... You choose to be dicks? Yeah, it's hilarious. I am not totally sure this is 100% scientifically accurate. Oh, I am the- Ow! I am the- Ow! <laughs> Well, I'd say this is a perfect way to spend a Friday night. <laughs> Joanna L. Never change. Well, I think she's changed a whole lot, Kitty. Well, then she can go f*** herself. Brian tries to warn Stewie about Pouncey's true plan, and he's revoked. So he goes right to the source. Meg, however, has some choice words. Look, you may be our family dog, but you've never really been my dog. I'm a punching bag, and there were some days where I could have really used a dog to help cheer me up. And where were you? Thank you! Seriously, Brian, you have ruined this girl. You told her to stay with the Griffins because it was mature to be a sponge that the family, like, froze all their abuse onto. You told on her to Peter and Lois for dating a convict rather than just telling the warden or going straight to Meg on top of following her around for your paper rather than just politely asking to interview her or shadow her. And since I'm a big fan of the rule of three, you spit on her to make her go down the vent. That's battery, Brian. But I'm not showing that scene. I hate bodily fluids. Speaking of... Stewie for your little time travel adventures. You know about the time machine? Yeah, my room's right next door. That thing's loud as Sucks that in most episodes, she doesn't even talk to Stewie or acknowledge him. She ignores him more than Lois does nowadays. It sucks too, considering how he and Chris get along. I think him and Meg would make a really great team. Humans are masochists, man. You should see how many toys they've bought me. Haven't played with one. What? No, humans are viewers. They're how I make money. And afford Taco Bell. And dresses. You make me so happy, Pouncy. This is gonna sound weird. But do you want to dance? Strangely, Pouncy dances back and hypnotizes her with a cat scratch fever. That's how it begins. And then we introduce a show. Nah, I'm joking. But you should really bring back that show. That night, Meg has cat lady dreams and is led away by Pouncy to fulfill her ultimate destiny. Being a cat lady. I mean, duh. Say goodbye to Meg. Who's Ned? Um, 
I think he runs a declassified school survival guide, or he's Sally and Possible's cousin. Take your pick. The next morning, Brian finds a note in Meg's room, which translates to, I'm leaving, meow, meow. Yes, you have to say it exactly like that. And thank you, Catherine, for translating this document for me. Oh my god! She left, didn't she? Quagmire? I heard everything you were saying about Pouncy, Brian. And you were right to be concerned. Glenn, what are you doing here? As it turns out, Glenn is well aware of Pouncy's ultimate plans, and better yet... Sometimes, when they find the right person, they enslave them to do their bidding for the rest of their lives. Someone to take care of all the feral cats in a neighborhood. Yeah, still sure that's not scientifically accurate, but this was my family. Maybe because we had a lot of outdoor cats, one of whom was male. Turns out toxoplasmosis is not a parasite. It's what causes an obsession with cats, not unlike vampires. As Quagmire explains... So what you're saying is that everyone who likes cats only likes them because they literally have crap in their brain? That's correct. What? People who like dogs just like them because they're chill as hell? That's correct. Wow, what a bulletproof fact. All right, it's a joke. I don't have to argue how incorrect they are. I, I know they aren't being serious. I can laugh. <laughs> See, I laughed. To this end, the cats will isolate one person who is often insecure or depressed to begin with and then force them to take care of them permanently. The crazy cat lady will start to knit a fuzzy sweater and if they put the sweater on, it's all over. You're not gonna come with me? I can't. <gasps> they have me too. Go, Brian! Get out of here! Wait, so is Elle Joanna a cat lady? Or is this why Quackmire is so obsessed? You know what? I'll get to this later. Speaking of, this whole episode reminds me of something. Something I did not notice until I wrote the script. One of my favorite modern American Dad episodes, The Free Fs, where Francine, who is feeling mistreated and neglected by her family, befriends a pet. A pet frog, not a cat. She names the frog Jumpers. Kind of similar to Pouncy, don't you think? And, as it turns out, said animal wants to isolate the victim and use them for a nefarious purpose. For Jumpers, he wants to turn Francine into food for his young. With the cats, they want Meg as a caregiver. These frogs are going to eat you! I want them to, because they're my family. It is time. Adios! Oh! To be fair, the free apps aired and was likely produced after Family Cat, but I like both episodes the same. And I don't think they're rip-offs, so to speak. I do prefer the free apps in terms of the horror aspect, especially after Francine kicks her family out and starts to make the house more welcoming for the frogs. I'm gonna call someone for you. <laughs> and the army will do anything to keep the animal for themselves. But I prefer the humor aspect from Family Guy as it's a tad more relatable. Another good part about this episode is that it features Brian and Quagmire teaming up, a super rarity. They both love Meg and they both want to make up for past mistakes. Brian goes to stop Pouncy and tracks Meg down to a house, an abandoned house, full of cats. You're doing great, Meg. Yeah, I feel good. Like I belong here. Will I get used to You'll the- You'll get used to the smell, yes. It reminds me of that old Animal Planet show about animal hoarders. Oh my god, you guys remember when Animal Planet was like the TLC of animals? And now it's like the X's or Chalk Zone, like it faded from collective memory, like somebody threw it into the Omega device. I only remember it's a thing when the puppy bowl airs. Brian tries to appeal to Meg, and when that doesn't work, he fights the cats with all of his might. Oh, stop with that noise! Stop it! Stop it! Ah, it's worse than wormy. Brian is nearly taken down, and Meg is about to put on the sweater until they're saved by midnight. Not a sound from the pavement. What? It's from Cats, you idiot! <gasps> Quagmire, you're quoting one of my favorite musicals? Even though, to be fair, I feel like outside of Taylor Swift's rendition of Macavity, the movie sucked and it really should have been animated. Quagmire appeals to Meg. You have your whole life ahead of you. Cats are amazing, but they're also complete 
and you're too young to give it all up for them. And he sacrifices himself to stay in the heavy side layer. That way, Meg doesn't have to. Look, a new day has begun. Or what about fecal matters? A flu scare hits Quahog, and this encourages Brian to try to 23 and me himself and see his likelihood for certain diseases. Not Ancestry.com. <laughs> no, Brian is going to spring for the expensive. <laughs> Brian discovers. Hmm. Wait, what was that? It was nothing. Oh my god, Brian! You're 1% cat! OMG, you know what that means, right? Brian is a <coughs> town, like Vinny. No wonder he pulls in so many ladies. Even though Vinny is more of a <coughs> town than he is, it sucks he isn't part Neanderthal like Randy, or he would have actual privileges. And speaking of, I was curious about this. Apparently, you cannot crossbreed a cat and a dog. Their DNA is much too different. Brian starts to have an existential crisis and this causes him to begin to behave much like a cat. Hey, Stewie. What was that? Was that a cat stretch? Oh my god, is that what that looks like? What? You don't stretch all weird in the morning? Sorry if I sleep in weird angles. Or there's this. Jump up. Psst, psst, psst. Jump up. Come on, there's a spot right here. Come on up, be a friend. Just jump up. Yeah. Brian goes to brag about his newfound heritage to Glenn, who strangely doesn't start brown nosing Brian. So, I guess you and I are cool. <laughs> I don't care what you did to convince yourself that you're a cat. You are not a cat, Brian. Yeah, Brian. I know you and I both have white fur, but come on. Do you sip from a bathroom faucet? Or eat plastic bags? Or lick the table after it's been cleaned with bleach? My cats were weird. And I know that... Come on, I should not insult somebody's heritage. I'm no Ted Wasana song, but this is Brian, so. Instead, Quagmire gives Brian a challenge. If you're really a cat, prove it by jumping off your roof. If you land on your feet, safe and sound, I'll agree that you're a cat. That's it. Just jump. Done. Ooh, Glenn remembers how Joe's revenge was an episode. This ought to be good. Rather than admit defeat, Brian takes him up on the challenge and... Not a cat. Oof, poor boy. At least Stewie gives him a rousing speech. 1% Snoopy and 2% Great Guy. Thanks, Stewie. Finally, let's take a look at Cat Fight, the ultimate Quagmire Cat episode. Not as much of a favorite as Family Cat, but still enjoyable. The guys, like usual, are at the bar, where else would they be, their own houses, and seem to be hearkening back to 420, as Quagmire isn't there. Methinks he found a new lady friend. Don't say methinks ever again, Joe. Me thinks Peter doth protest too much. No! Soon afterwards, Quagmire shows up with a brand new cat in tow named Albertine. Oh, this little oogie woogie is my new friend Albertine, who thinks she's French. Cute name. <gasps> kind of similar to my real name, but much more noble and less old lady-ish. Like usual, Glenn is laying on thick with the cat love. Practically a surrogate daddy. Feels it's not truly a meal unless you serve bread. Isn't that right, Albertine? You gotta serve bread? I don't believe she's ever said any of that. Oh, I love bread. This time, there's a reason besides humor. Quagmire has opened up a cat cafe. If you don't know, it's basically a normal cafe. But the catch is, cats get to roam around. You get to pet them, all that jazz, and just drink coffee and sit next to them. And I've never been in one, guys, so I'm sorry. From what I can gather, they are pretty common internationally, but they are gaining traction in in the United States. I think there was like one or two in New York. I should go, I'm like right there. However, it seems as though Peter does not enjoy my Shakespearean longings and has challenged Joe to a duel on my behalf. He thinks the cat cafe sounds like a great idea. That's it, Joe. I challenge you to a duel. Pistols at midnight. Oh, you wanna throw hands now, Peter? We hawking is right there.
Peter, did you bring a flamethrower? No. Yeah, I can't compete with that. Because I love fire, I would be too distracted. The guys go to support Quagmire and visit his cat cafe, which is called, oh my god, the Barista Cats, as I'm wearing Aristocat PJs. Why? Well, besides that one joke, but also, well, everybody wants to be a cat because a cat's the only cat who knows where it's at. Wait, I can't sing the whole song. Darn it, it seems as though the cat cafe is a massive success and has attracted a bunch of customers old and new and it's like if i had nine lives maybe i'd finally find a man <laughs> you's joining me bruce you should invite jeffrey over you free would have an amazing subplot and he would love this place read our most private communications and then sell back at us the very things they've eavesdropped about Fun fact, I worked on this script during New Year's. Holidays are fun when you're a YouTuber. Brian is going to another bar when he hears... <gasps> hey! Shut up! Oh yeah, how could I forget? Brian hates the cat cafe for two reasons. First off, he's a dog, and second, he hates Glenn. So he loudly argues in front of Glenn's customers. Now get out of here, you're making all my cats angry. That's why they're hissing. Actually, frightened cats hiss, angry cats moan. Brian promises to become Glenn's worst nightmare and reignites their rivalry, but... Listening to other people's I nightmares is my worst that? nightmare! Ah. Oh, thank God. I gotta shut down that cat place. Wait, so was the cat place real? Did this episode actually happen? Is it a multiverse? I am so confused. Brian decides to shut the cat cafe down on the virtue of it being unsafe. Yeah, he just doesn't like Glenn. As Brian points out, Wikipedia states that toxoplasmosis is a parasitic disease spread by exposure to infected cat feces. Brian, I just talked about what that was. Stop mansplaining. But I don't think the cat cafe is as unsanitary as you're making it. Most cat cafes usually give the cats their own private spaces, away from the other people, and they usually adhere to strict safety standards, like constant cleanings or observing the cats or stuff like that. Glenn is a pilot, so outside of seducing a lot of women illegally, I think he's all for following the rules. Too bad that if they pointed this out, we would have no episode. Well, that's enough of that show. But Dad, we want to see what happens at Christian camp! Alright, but they're on thin ice. Oh yeah, I guess I should probably take a moment to talk about the Christian camp subplot. Sorry, I wanted to talk about this one part of the episode. Lois thinks that the kids are misbehaving too much and believes they would benefit from going to a Christian camp. Even before this, I'd worried about our church attendance dropping off. Now with the kids showing a complete lack of morals, well, we may all need to go to Christian family camp. Do they have accountability buddies there? Too bad, the camp is not what Lois expected. Okay, a little dark on the hair there. Let's lighten it up, lighten it up. Eyes should be blue. Would you rather he draw Ein Bear? The trio eventually escape, but Meg runs away to Japan. I'm a lay, Meg. <laughs> <laughs> Family guy, over. On the Foxy! Sorry, I just wanted to get this out of the way. I liked both plots. I just, I felt like this should have been two separate episodes. You could have had the Griffins all go to camp together. I don't know. Regardless, as Brian has decided to be a Karen without the haircut, the cafe is closed until the health department can evaluate it. The city has decided to shut this establishment down. Really? You're closing the cafe? That's right. Thanks to you, I'm out of business. Yay, Brian won. I'm so happy my kind is being discriminated and segregated from humans. All that progress down the litter box. But have you ever heard about karma? Brian tries to go to a bar and finds... I come in here all the time. Well, apparently due to some recent public health concerns, the city has said that no animals of any kind are allowed in any public establishment. 
What? <laughs> oh, but this is what you wanted, Brian. Worse yet, it's not just a bar. Brian literally can't go anywhere. Not a bar, not a store, nothing. He's housebound, like the cats he hates so much. But, but what is this? A picture of a mountain? When have we ever been to a mountain? What mountain even is it? That's Mount Kohog. Yeah. Oh, Brian, I can only imagine how you were during 2020. And because Quagmire got the business shut down, Glenn has taken the cats in and becomes a cat hoarder. So how's it going? Well, not bad. Got plenty of company. Well, that's good. I haven't seen you at the clam. Well, I've been pretty busy. Even though, from what I understand, some cat cafes do make it where you can adopt the cats. I, that's apparently one of the purposes. But again, I am reminded of Animal Planet. Worse yet, one of his cats died. We came to see how it's going. Uh, how's it going? I got a dead cat on a pitchfork. I don't even know which can to put it in. Trash? Yard trimmings? Recycling? I think you could just bury it in your backyard. Or if you're afraid future neighbors might find your cat's skeleton, why not try a pet cemetery? Just remember what Jonathan said. Sometimes dead is better. To help Brian, Stewie tries to turn him into an emotional support animal. Emotional support animal? Wear this. Every place will have to let you in. So long as I'm with you. As a bar will totally allow a baby in there just as much as they will allow a dog. Eh, at least he can go to the store and buy alcohol if it comes to that. Well, it works, but for all of five seconds. Say something nice about me right now. Come on, Stewie, that's not what this is. It is now. Say something nice about me or I'll disappear like a serial killer in a 90s movie. Brian goes home. You! You son of a bitch! This is all your fault! You know what, Glenn? You kind of have a point, but did you really not check with the health? But did you really not check with the health department first, just to be sure everything was up to code? Finally, we get the climax of their rivalry, and yes, the C word was very much intended. They fight. You thirsty boy? Yeah, you're a thirsty boy. Oh, wait a minute, we're fighting. Oh! Just like Quagmire to add an innuendo to a fight. However, in the process, Brian gets hit by a bus as a consequence of a running gag. Brian, oh my god, are you alright? Flashbacks! At long last, the pair realize. Look at us. What are we doing? <sighs> I don't even know anymore. You know what? I'm sorry I destroyed your dream, Quagmire. Brian apologizes, and Quagmire reveals why he opened up the cat cafe. Someday I'm gonna be dead. And, I, I mean, is that my legacy? I just thought if I created something that makes people happy, maybe people would remember me for that. Quagmire, there's no easy way to say this, but what is a legacy? It's planting seeds in a garden you never get to see. And you planted so much seed from yourself that you could solve world hunger. <laughs> However, I must emphasize this. Stop talking like my intrusive thoughts, you and Hamilton and Debbie. The town repeals the law. Somehow, maybe Glenn, I don't know, lobbied? And Brian is allowed to go out in public. And it seems as though the pair finally put aside their rivalry. Thanks, Brian. What do you say? You want to go for a walk? I always want to go for a walk. Yay! Now with these things out of the way, I have to wonder, why does Quagmire, destroyer of women's privates, like cats this badly? So I can make a pun about Quagmire's love of a certain woman named Willow? A hairy woman at that? Well, obviously, I think it's because it's funny. Maybe part of it is derived from Seth MacFarlane, who is a cat owner, but are there other reasons? Well, I think it sort of relates to the fact that Quagmire Quagmire, for all of his faults, is human. As we see from time to time, Quagmire is a monster human who needs to be kept away from children. Like, honestly, this dude does more than just peep. But as we see from time to time, we are reminded that he's human and he can make mistakes.
facts and feel emotions. For example, in Quagmire's Baby, he's forced to take care of his daughter, Anna Lee. Oh, cute name. But Quagmire realized that being a father isn't for him. And even if it hurts him, he knows it's better to allow Anna Lee to stay with her adopted parents because they can give her the life that he can't. I feel like in many ways, a cat is obviously much easier to take care of than a human being. Quagmire can give it all his love and it can't get in the way of his lifestyle. Plus, they are awesome chick magnets. Especially if Quagmire ever thinks about having somebody over for round two. Plus, he doesn't have to worry about the cat being in the way or talking to him. Just keep the cat in a separate room or close the bedroom door. It won't get in. However, I feel like the explanation we sort of got in Family Cat is valuable too, even if we take away the whole cat toxin angle. Despite how funny he can be, Quagmire is lonely. He has nobody. We know that he finds it hard to love, and every time he does manage to love, that woman is just out of reach, but drove to another. Next to Meg, he would be the perfect candidate to become a cat lady. Somehow, this reminds me of Hank Hill, of all people. Hank is a closed off person to everybody. He can't hug people or say I love you. The most he does is a handshake and in public, it's one hand only. But he has a certain affection for his dog, Ladybird, for no other reason than she's old and quiet, and as an animal, she can't talk back to him or reject him or embarrass him. Like, Ladybird even got Hank to cry. Wow, it's weird to think these two have something in common, but there's one thing I wanna say. I'm surprised that Glenn's love of cats is not that big of an obsession. Obviously, in Family Guy fashion, and he does go pretty far at times. But I was surprised at how little Glenn's obsession actually comes up. Like, yeah, it's one of his main traits, but it's not a big deal, so to speak. At best, it's usually just a few jokes sprinkled here and there, like in a litter box. Just to remind you, remember guys, Glenn loves cats. Part of me kind of did not want to make this video since it was getting hard to find quagmire cat moments. But part of me also had jokes. So I jumped head first into this quagmire and worked harder than a cat trying to bury turds on a marble floor. I gotta say, regardless, I don't think he was flanderized. Thank you, writers. It's great. Anyhow, I'll be in Raleigh all weekend for Animate. And I'll be doing four panels. Can't wait to see See you there, a me. The giant chicken. Oh yeah, your big rival. Yeah, it was my turn. <laughs>